So, a little bit about me. My name is Danny Potter. I am absolutely obsessed with the brain, the mind, and human beings as a whole. Um, and as individuals, and as parts of human beings. Um, really seriously, people are just incredible and amazing. Uh, my specific specialty is I graduated in psychology and emphasis in neuropsychology. Uh, and just like Tommy Boy, it took me seven years to get my degree. Unlike Tommy Boy, that was because I had five different majors. Each one of them taught me a lot of things about human beings. I was temporarily going into hard sciences and studied chemistry and organic chemistry. I studied exercise science. I studied business and industrial organizations, the way that people work as a society and as a group and as individuals. And then ended up in psychology deciding that what I really want to do is be with people all day long working on people issues. So currently I'm pursuing licensure as a, uh, a mental, uh, mental health counselor. And, uh, and that's, that's what I'm going into. My writing... Uh, resume is I wrote for a game called Dust, which was a game to teach science to uh, teens and young adults. It was a study to see if we could teach via alternate reality or <laughs> augmented reality gaming, which is not virtual reality gaming, um, uh, teach science and whether that would be an effective tool. It was a really fascinating project. And I uh, won a very, very small, uh, but dear to my heart, short story writing contest uh, called uh, Forget the Fairies. It's Twisted Fairy Tales. Mine was a Cinderella uh, sci-fi spy thriller. Um, but uh, my, my particular emphasis today, as, as you're going to find out as I discuss creativity, well, I'm a creative. Therefore, I am exceptionally good at procrastinating because I'm an average creative. This is actually a trait of creativity. Now, this means that I don't have this as prepared as I like. And also, like a creative, I am unaware of what goes on in a lot of levels of my brain. So I had no idea that I was actually nervous or excited about this until I lay awake for five and a half hours last night. And so I'm running on two hours of sleep. Now, fortunately for me, I have a uh, nearly unmarketable skill of being able to not fall asleep for long periods of time and still pretend that I'm functional. But if I start to ramble, I get more and more talkative and more and more tangent related as I get less and less sleep. So please bear with me. All right, now what is creativity? Creativity, if we look at it objectively, is being able to come up with fabulous new things, but that is wrong. I'm sorry, it is just absolutely wrong. I want any of you to imagine a new color that you've never seen. You cannot do that. And yet the mantis shrimp can see infrared and ultraviolet in the visual spectrum. We cannot, we cannot even imagine a color that we've never seen. We can combine two colors to form a blend of the two that we might not have encountered, but that's by no means certain. What we are is incredibly highly associative creatures. Now this can be both a good thing and a bad thing. I was on massive amounts of wellness panels um, and at this, well, massive amounts of me, okay. I'm, I'm dramatic, I'm a writer, so it's like, fine. <laughs> but uh, for a lot of the wellness track, I was there for like probably over half of them. Um, and, and this is because we included this track and focus on this track because if you are a creative, I can tell you several things that are probable about you. Not for sure, like Brandon Sanderson is a freak, um, but you probably procrastinate. He's a procrastinator, he's, he's an exception. Um, you probably uh, have a very high IQ. You probably are an introvert. I'm an outlier in that because I'm a freak. I am like a hypervert. Um, you probably, uh, have some amount of anxiety or depression or some other symptom or diagnosis of mental illness. This is because you have a superpower. One of the other panels was superpower or mental illness. The answer is almost universally both. Now, I'm going to discuss that partially today and discuss the way the creativity works. You're going to hear a little bit about the way that your mind may work if you're an average creative. Now, I want to state every single one of these rules is an absolute inviolate law until it's not applicable. Um, the first rule of psychology is there are no rules. The second rule is you don't talk about psychology. Um, but um, the, the, So everything that I'm stating, I will state it, it is an average, it is a most likely because the final frontier is the human brain. It is the least understood organism of any that I can think of. Because every time we find out something about it, we find out that we're wrong. For example, if you study the history of declaring people dead, 
Now, I'm, I'm a huge, voracious student of pretty much everything. But if you study, how do you tell if someone is dead? You start out, well, they, they are no longer breathing, is, is the way that it used to be. But you can still have heartbeat. You can still have mental activity while you're not breathing, at least for a few seconds. Then, okay, well, then it's the heartbeat. So as soon as they don't have a heartbeat, then they're dead. But then you get people who flatline and they come back. So, okay, it's brain activity. Once they're brain dead, they're dead, because that's like the master gland. It controls absolutely everything. And if they're wrong. It's amazing, but it is wrong. If you put an EEG onto someone's scalp to measure their brain activity, it will be absolutely nothing. There's no activity in their verbal cortex. There's no activity in their audible, audio, ugh, audible, the thing that hears. <laughs> There's nothing. And they're in a coma for six months. And then they wake up and they tell you verbatim, yeah, this is how I felt when you had this conversation by my bedside. Now, I don't care whether or not you believe in religion, I personally do, uh, but I also believe in hard science and I believe that evolutionary theory has a whole lot that it can tell us and it's very important. I quite frankly believe in evolution. I'm not here to have a debate about whether or not that's real. Just consider what I'm saying about it. Now, these people heard and understood and comprehended and transmitted, uh, trans translated everything that everyone was saying around them and they could hear it, despite the fact they had no brain activity. So this tells us that we know nothing. What I've discovered is I've talked to gajillions of scientists. I'm the annoying guy who challenges everything in every one of their classes. And as I've talked to these high-level scientists, I've discovered that the beginning high-level scientists are almost universally atheists and will declare to you exactly what we know and exactly what we don't know. The higher-level scientists will say, we have no idea about absolutely anything. There is no way to prove that anything does not exist or does exist. We just take pretty darn good guesses. <laughs> That is what's true. So please, yes, there's lots of debates. Save comments and questions toward the end. I'll try to give you time. But, um, so creativity is highly associative. We as human beings are associative creatures. I did this in last year's presentation. Probably it's not going to be a complete repeat. But this is a wobbly-woo. Wobbly-woo says, scree! This is a goblin. Uh, that's actually a thing. This is a gobble. <laughs> Gobbles say, narc. Which one says scree? Okay. Now, that's very interesting because I didn't tell you that, but you think that I did. You associated that without me telling you. You did what no other creature on the earth can do. Not even apes that know sign language can do this. Which is, I gave you the verbal, I gave you the audible, and I gave you the visual. I connected this one to this one, this one to this one, but I didn't connect these two. You did that on your own. That's something that no other creatures can do. That is the essence of creativity. As human beings, we excel. We are the alpha predators of this world because we connect cause and effect. We connect relationships. We associate things. We find a gap. And we are driven nuts by gaps in our knowledge. Give me a gap and I will try to figure it out. This also happens mentally um, on a very, very deep subconscious level. Just like you came up with that connection. That's a very simple connection to come up with according to us. It's pretty impressive if you think about it just in terms of abstract concepts. But it seems quite simple, but we can come up with extremely complicated ones. In mental health, I see people who are a youngest child, and just due to their interpretation, this isn't going to be every youngest child, but due to this specific individual, saw that his older brothers and sisters could walk and he could not. Therefore, he assumed he was somehow inferior because these ones are close to my age and they can walk. Well, they've got a few years on you, bud. But he's like a year old and he doesn't understand that. So he assumes he is inferior. And then I watch this build. And we, t we go over it, and I'm not purely a developmental psychologist and all your problems are re related to your childhood, because it's the framework, not the event. And the framework that he used evaluated unconsciously for years that he was inferior to other people, that other people were always more capable, and therefore he ended up with a social anxiety. He was terrified because everyone else was so much better than him without realizing that everyone else thinks that about everyone else. Not uniformly, but massively, especially in creative circles. We all feel like everybody else has it together. Everybody else knows what's going on. And one of the saddest things is when you have all these people feeling completely alone in houses right next to each other. This is one reason why I speak out against the, uh, the stigma of, of mental health. If you have a mental health issue, please talk about it. Don't be afraid of it. It is not a sickness or an illness. It is a facet, and it is a feature, and that's what I want to get to. So, in your brain, you have gray matter, you have white matter. Now, this is an extremely simplified version of it, but basically, gray matter stores, stores the information, white matter shifts the information. If you're creative, average, you probably have a massive amount of white matter. This leads to automatic thought. That didn't happen. 
<laughs> this leads to automatic thought. What this means is you form associations subconsciously. Now, the way that I like to kind of say it is as you're problem solving, for example, I like to say this is your conscious mind. And there's you in your conscious self. Now, the conscious mind is not really one thing as far as we can figure out, but let's just pretend this is just a model. I'm just don't, don't debate, it's not real, it's just a drawing on it. Anyway, um, now, this is an office and this is the manager. Now, the manager can't control everything that everybody does. And he's up on this balcony here, and then he's got his, like, his supervisors here. So you got, you know, your various right brain, left brain things. You got your, I'm not going to say it ego, alter ego, because I'm not Freudian. Um, but uh, you got all these other people here. Now, most everything that this guy says and does is through a megaphone. These guys are hard at work in their cubicles. Maybe they're too focused to be actually hearing, but they're going to catch something every once in a while. And then you have all these little guys down here, and then tons of little ones that all report to these guys. You got this big pyramid scheme. These functions are so incredibly complex. You have a function that allows you to perceive outlines. That is made up of a function which allows you to perceive horizontal lines and vertical lines and diagonal lines and corners and curves and you have a subcortex of a subcortex, a cortex, all the great part of your brain is your, your cortex. Then you have a subcortex which does stuff and then a sub subcortex and a sub 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 so all of them they're cortices. All these subcortices down here, they do have a facet of their own consciousness. To some extent we all have a small amount of disassociative identity disorder. You have facets of personality attached to some of these. If you're a particularly stubborn person and don't like to be told what to do, sometimes you'll think something down and this one, it'll go through an odd channel and then so it'll arrive to this one without saying it's from me. And it'll just come in and, and you'll say, no, no, I don't, I don't wanna hear that. I don't wanna, like, I, you can't tell me what to do when it's you telling yourself. <laughs> so if you ever feel something and you don't wanna feel that against someone, there's probably something going on. Now the interesting thing is all these little guys, they come up and talk to these guys, and these guys come up and talk to these guys, and as they're passing by, they sometimes catch snatches of it. They don't really know what's going on. The whole you together does because of your interconnected white matter, but they don't always know what's going on. And so they make assumptions based on what they hear. So this guy says, oh, I've identified this. According to my personality, that makes me angry. And this one over here looks and says, and so he sends a message to the angry guy. And this guy here says, hey, wait. I'm angry. And then he says, oh, you're angry. Why are you angry? It must be because of this. <laughs> so you ever blow up at someone and you realize it's completely unrelated. Your stress is completely unrelated to what you're doing. But you're a problem solver. You have to justify why it's going on. Now, this, all that sub-coordination is automatic thought. A lot of times when you have an emotion, it's based on a thought, which is based on an emotion or a thought, an emotion, whatever. You have all of this going on at such a deep, deep level that when it arrives, it bypasses the fact checker. And you think to yourself, that person is wrong. You come up with the reason why they're wrong instead of asking yourself if you really do believe that they're wrong. Now, this is where the mental illness comes in. Because oftentimes we're then trying to solve problems that aren't really the problem. And we're trying to solve it via means that don't work. For example, you give a cocaine addict sugar, it will kick off some of his craving. Like, cut it. A pornography addict, a lot of times what they really seek is connectivity to another person. That's what they want. But they know that this will give them a quick release of oxytocin, which will start to make them feel connected to someone until they realize there's no one to connect that oxytocin to. And so a lot of mental illnesses, us trying to solve problems that we don't understand where they're coming from. And because we're inside this machine, we're inside this whole process, we can't find where exactly that's coming from. That's where mental health professionals come in, and that's why almost every mental health professional sees a mental health professional. It's because we're bad creatures. The world is too big for us to figure out by ourselves, and our problems are way too complex for us to figure out how they got there. We're the person that created the problem accidentally, and therefore, do we think we're going to have the equipment to undo that or even to see where the problem lies? It's not necessarily about you're broken or, or you're less than someone else. It's just you need another pair of eyes. Now, how does any of this relate to creativity? It's because this automatic thought 
Creativity and genius and creativity is combining things in a way that people have not thought to combine them, in a way that doesn't really make sense. So you are creative and your superpower is because you are crazy. You connect things in a way that nobody else would. These automatic thoughts happen before you can say, wait a minute, but does that make sense? You go, wait a minute, but that is so cool. Let me make that make sense. And you come up with something creative. Now, the way that, uh, okay. So, um, you're likely an intuitive person. You know a lot of things, a lot of things, and you're not sure how that you know them. Now, this is especially true if you're a woman. I don't mean to be sexist, and averages, averages. You can have men who are better than the average woman at this, and you can have women who are way worse than the average men at this, but now, averages, to, uh, to see things holistically and identify that there is a problem without identifying the problem. You know a thing, but you don't know how you know it. There's something wrong here. Now, I've seen this work brilliantly. I've seen it save the life of a six-month-old child. My wife noticed that he looked odd. It turned out one ear was sticking out farther than the other, and even when she told me, I couldn't see it. But that's how sensitive this intuition was. She saw the whole thing, figured out there was a problem, and then went looking for it. Now, that is one strong aspect. Now, it can also be that you misdiagnose what might be wrong. But some subcortex of a subcortex of a subcortex has very specifically identified a thing, or falsely identified a thing. Now, this works really brilliantly. Uh, because it alters the way that you learn. I specifically learn very slowly um, until I learn all at once. <laughs> this is because most people are linear learners. A lot of creatives are lateral learners. Now, as I speak a little bit more on this, you'll understand that I don't really believe this means a lot. I have an IQ of 145, the average is 100. I'm technically a genius, but that does not mean that I am smart. <laughs> My wife came up to me just a little bit ago and was like, hey, we need to check out of the room. And I'm like, well, I, my thing doesn't, uh, it's, it's at one, so I, I can just check out afterwards, right? Because the late checkout's at two. She's like, yeah, your thing's from one to two. <laughs> and I'm like, right. <laughs> so being a genius does not mean you are smart. It means that your brain works in different ways. It also means you are likely to be incredibly disorganized. You are likely to have mental illness and emotional issues. I am both borderline, borderline personality disorder and borderline bipolar. Um, they're things that I've worked a lot with and I've struggled a lot with, but they're things that are part of my superpower. I get the strength that comes with that, but I also get some of the burden. Don't feel like anything different about you is wrong or is less. It is the most difficult thing to sit in front of someone and to say, yes, you do need help. What is because you're beautifully brilliant? And that's why you need help. <laughs> Einstein got pneumonia four times because he would wake up, and they, they bought him an apartment right across the street because they didn't trust him to drive, because he was so genius that he wouldn't pay attention to where he was going or traffic. <laughs> and he'd be unraveling the mysteries of the universe and plow into somebody. And so they bought him an apartment right across the street from Princeton University. Well, that didn't work. Because he'd wake up in the middle of the night, have a brilliant idea, run out in his boxers. Now this is in New Jersey, not just New Jersey, but a little while ago before it got really warm, and he'd be like hip deep in snow. And so he's running out there, and he runs through this to his lab, and he gets pneumonia four times because there's no heat on in his lab! <laughs> this isn't today! And then finally they decide, okay, well, let's give him a catwalk and keep his lab heated, because he's gonna be in there in his underwear in the middle of the night. This is not sane behavior, it is brilliant behavior. <laughs> now, um, and Brandon Sanderson actually touches on this, if you read The Way of Kings, there's a specific character who is at times absolutely brilliant, and at times absolutely stupid, and the most brilliant he ever was, no one could understand him, and he was the most heartless, cruel individual when he was that brilliant. Sometimes he's downright idiotic, and too stupid to even speak English but he's a lot more emotionally together then. And it's a really interesting trade-off. There is no such thing as better or worse. There is different. There are, depending on who you ask, 40 to 100 billion neurons inside the human brain. Each one of them has up to 7,000 different connections to other neurons, which gives you how many possible variations? Yeah. <laughs> I'm in psychology because I don't really do math. I did not study that. So, um, so, that is a massive amount, more connections than we estimate. There are stars. Wow. 
This means no one, doesn't matter how many times you say you've met your doppelganger, you've met someone exactly like you, no one in the history of mankind has ever been like you. Now, carrying on to the more specific practical aspects, um, the good of this, you get varied emotions. Bipolar individuals are more likely to commit suicide than any other. This is because you have an extreme high contrasted by an extreme low. If you have any one level of neurotransmitters for long enough, it will begin to lose its effectiveness and you'll just return to this set point. If you have massive amounts of dopamine in your system, after a while you're just going to feel normal. If you're going to have dopamine receptors that will attract and you're going to end up balancing out and triggering dopamine neurons just about as much as everybody else. This means that when you have that high, that manic, that super, which by the way, bipolar is the most common for creatives. The most common. Any kind of creative, be it an author, be it a, a, an actor, be it a, a painter, the most common. You have this high, this elation, this I can do anything moment. I have a friend who's bipolar, and by the time I graduated with my undergraduate degree, he had three bachelor's degrees, two master's degrees, had founded two companies, published two books, uh, all while running the marathon club and participating in a different cross-country running club and I uh, had sold two, I think, board games. <laughs> now this is the manic side. Hyper, hyper productive, amazing, super excited. This is the muse. This is when you just write all night because it's brilliant and you know it's brilliant and you know that what you're doing is amazing and beautiful and then you wake up the next day and it's all crap and you're rubbish and why do you even try it? I just can't. I don't stress. <laughs> that is the bomb out low. But that low enables you to feel the thrill of that high. Because without it, you would retract all of those sensors and you just flatline. And just, eh, it's all normal. Now, this isn't universally true. I mean, there is depression where you are constantly depressed. But there is a unipolar depression aspect where, I mean, you can be unipolar depression one way and unipolar depression the other. I'm almost unipolarly slightly manic, if you can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> um, but then there's the unipolar depression the other way where it's down low. And a lot of them live fairly normal lives. What's the problem is the variance. Because the more up and down you go, the more you feel it. So you get extremely vivid emotions. You get extremely vivid experiences. Now, the bad... <coughs> oh, and uh, you're, you're very curious. And often, you can put yourself in situations that you've never been into. And be able to understand them better than maybe the average bear. Because you have all of these varied experiences that are kind of happening to you. Emotions are not necessarily who you are. They are more often things that happen to you. Many thoughts as well. Don't worry too much if you think something really screwed up. Because a lot of times it's just a thing that's happening to you. If it's not a thing you meant to think, a thing you'd want to think, don't worry, it's just the way the brain works. So, um, this up and down. Now, um, it also means, uh, depending on the type of connectivity you have, you may be a very good liar. <laughs> now this is a really good thing. <laughs> In some cases. For example, most Olympic athletes are exceptional liars. That's why they can do what they can do. That's why they can push themselves beyond the limits of what is physically considered our limit. That's why we constantly have new world right well that and a whole bunch of other stuff. Like technology of running shoes is seriously a big deal. I research everything, I'm sorry. <laughs> but um, what they do is they fool themselves. They're such good liars that this automatic thought has been wired to a point. They have trained their mind to bypass, I can't do this anymore, and to get straight to, I must. So they lie to themselves, you can do this. You do have more to give. You can be the best in the world. And that's, for most of them, going to be a lie. But they would never have stood where they were if they were not able to lie to themselves in that fashion. Now, as authors, we have this a little bit more flip side. We're like the most strange combination of narcissism and self-loathing that has ever existed, I think, in the history of the universe. The grandiosity of, I can be heard by everyone, until you get halfway through, and they're like, this is rubbish, and then you finish, and you're like, this is brilliant, and then you wake up the next day, and it's like, this is the worst thing ever. That's okay. That is an aspect of your brilliance and your creativity. It's just fine. Don't worry about that. Now, the bad things. High mental illness. Those automatic thoughts can be very dangerous and very pernicious. They can be exceptional for connecting things that we have never considered connecting, or that you might not, but they can be very pernicious. Now, you're also most likely disorganized. Your brain is doing this with everything that you learn. 
if you're the average lateral learner. So as I would learn a thing, they'd say, here's an aspect of human cognition, <coughs> and I wouldn't hear the next 20 minutes of the lecture. Because they oh, and here's how it applies in, 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 uh, in business. And oh, here's, oh, this could be a possible medical explanation for this. I wonder if that's, and, and maybe, maybe like over here with, with uh, racism and, 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 and uh, social ills, this might be an explanation for this. And oh, this is, and so I'm connecting all of these things together. Meanwhile, he's gone in this very careful, logical line. And then I come back to him like, holy crap, what, the, what is he talking about? <laughs> and I can't follow his logic because I'm doing this. <laughs> However, I would discover I was behind until about 75%, 80% of the way through any given course. And then all of these connections that I'd made had taught me basic fundamental principles, which snapped the whole thing into place. And I would instantly be getting straight A's and be way ahead of everyone else in the class. I would still come out with a C, because up until then I'd be getting a D minus. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> that's where the saying comes from, A students teach B students to work for C students. Now, if you're an A student, do not feel bad, because this is an average, and you are exceptional, I promise. Now, the other aspect, procrastination. There's this guy, um, he wrote originals, he wrote... Adam Grant, thank you. Um, Adam Grant is, is brilliant, and he's a procrastinator. He had... Huh? Procrastinator. No, precrastinator. Thank you. So he, he's a precrastinator um, and gets everything done way too early. But he studies originality and brilliance and, and creativity and things like this. And it's fascinating to read about it because he went and he talked to a whole bunch of companies and said, what are your most like creative people? People come up with these really brilliant ideas. And they pointed to these really sub-performing people. The ones that were always turning stuff in late and making excuses. And this is why. He talks about this specific business that was coming together, and uh, they offered him an investment in it. I don't remember the name of the business. It's a TED Talk. You can look it up. It's Adam Grant TED Talk. You can find it. It's gorgeous. But um, this particular group uh, decided they were going to start a company. And the day before their launch, they didn't have their website. This was a problem because this company was a website. <laughs> <laughs> now, they just were uh, offered, like, a Five billion dollar buyout, and were listed as Forbes' most innovative company of the decade. But he pulled out because the day before they weren't ready. So obviously it, they weren't ready to. Uh, they weren't really taking this series. They didn't really have a thing. After this, he said procrastination is a thing. So he went and he found that procrastinators are intelligent. Now, why would procrastination be connected to creativity? It's because the instant you set out on a topic, you have chosen a direction. You have chosen. And therefore, your bias is going to be slanted toward that. It closes certain amounts of the creative process. If you let it simmer, even in your unconscious mind, you ever wonder why you're just walking around and like hours later, the solution will come to you. Or you go to sleep with something, you wake up with the idea. Well, you have all of these low-level guys here. They're doing it. They're working on it. It doesn't matter how much you're not thinking about it. You can monitor your heart rate and your signs. And if you're worried about what it is, you're still going to be worried. You don't feel worried. You don't act worried. But your skin conductivity, heart rate, all that is elevated. More adrenaline in your blood, everything. You're still worried about it. You're still thinking about it. Just not you, you, but you are. So on this procrastination <coughs> level, you just let it sit. You let it stew. You let that hyperconnective brain connect and associate and come up with new things, new possibilities, new ideas. And if you're anything like me, you get to a point in your, like, in, in your, your story, whether you're a discovery writer or an outliner, and all of a sudden you realize you've accidentally triple booked your plot. <laughs> You've had this character end up here, here, and here. And you just, they're, they're completely contradictory. You can't have all of them happen. Well, you're just too darn creative. Write another book and have the other one happen. And uh, so this is, this is a significant point about procrastination. Now, I'm not saying just always procrastinate, because it is very difficult. Brandon Sanderson, one of the reasons he's so successful is that he completes things years before the deadline and turns them in. And he just writes and writes and writes and writes and writes. Now, what is procrastination? Well, we're going to get to that when I talk about writer's block. Um, now, the last one is, if you're a good liar, the good thing is you might believe your own lies. The bad thing is, you might believe your own lies. <laughs> now, Guy Winch, specifically, another TED Talk I would highly, highly recommend is G-U-Y-W-I-N-C-H, Guy Winch. And he talks about mental hygiene. He talks about how we have the five-year-old who, who has... Uh, been taught dental hygiene in kindergarten 
And yet, by the time he graduates from college, no one has taught him mental hygiene. <coughs> so, in a couple of the other panels, I mentioned the example that he gives. This young woman goes out on a date, and there's this guy, and he's good-looking, and he's attractive, and he's successful, and he's really, really sweet, he's fascinating to talk to, very considerate, and then they leave, and he doesn't call her again. And she's talking sober with her friend, and she's like, why, and a principal, of course not. You're not attractive. You're not successful. You have nothing interesting to say. You are just boring. And you're fat. <laughs> now this, you just want to punch that friend in the face. I mean, how could they... But this is her saying this to herself. And this is something that we have somehow come to believe is okay. As long as I'm not blaming someone else. As long as I'm only treating myself this way. And you might come to believe your own lies. This is incredibly damaging. Now, you can't always just stop it. You've been spending your entire life forming these, these specific functions and circuits inside of your brain. Hebian principle is neurons that fire together, wire together. If you think two things, then it's going to be a lot more likely you're going to think them in the future. It's kind of like you have many pathways that your brain can take. And when you talk about neural circuitry, now, once again, this is not real, this is a model. All right, so you have a neuron, and a neuron, and a neuron, and a neuron, and a neuron. Now, these guys are connected like this. There are dozens of different ways that everything can be connected. Not every one is connected to another. However, if this guy thinks a thing and it needs to get here, it can go here, it can go here. Whichever pathway it takes, it's more likely to take that same route next time. There are lots of different ways to address different problems, lots of different approaches. But this is why the pornography addict, when he feels down because he's lonely, will seek pornography. Because last time, what did I do last time I felt down? I did this. And that's how addictions form. Now, this is also what you do when you think those thoughts. The fascinating thing is, you are not creating or reinforcing the subcortex of your brain that criticizes you, that finds fault in you, you are reinforcing the facet of your brain that criticizes, period, and finds fault, period. Then your friend does something, and you think something really horrible about them, and then you hurt yourself, and you go, oh my gosh, how could I think, I must be horrible, and you get worse. <laughs> so, it's very trite to say that to love others, you must love yourself. It is really trite to say that. And I don't care whether you're religious or not, these scriptures make sense. Love thy neighbor as thyself. thyself. And how should I love my neighbor? As I have loved you. Whether or not you believe in God, you can assume God is love. So love is the being of ultimate love, has loved you, you should love you. It is okay to believe that you are a really good person. It's okay to believe that you're smart. It's okay to believe that you're brilliant. It's also okay to realize you're a complete dunderhead sometimes, as long as you don't hate yourself for it. Okay? I have an IQ of 144, which means I'm barely functional in society. <laughs> I have been fired from jobs because I can't get my head together. And this does not mean that I am smart. It means I am fit to a very specific context and situation, and I don't fit well in a lot of the others. As soon as I began to understand and appreciate those facets, and understand my weaknesses and my disorganization, my difficulty uh, getting things done in time, is not, it's not that I'm lazy. It's that this gives a benefit somewhere else. Yeah, I'm still going to work on it. But I'm not going to hate it anymore because that's one of the things I love most about me is my hyper-association with me. So, we often run into issues now with writer's block, with uh, finally sitting down to work, getting off of Facebook, sitting there, the, the anxiety of the empty page, you know, all these other things. I'm terrified to write because what if I don't write it right? Am I ready? Have I, am I done procrastinating and letting it stew? What do I do? The answer is there's absolutely no right answer. Anything that you do is going to have benefits. Anything that you do is going to have drawbacks. Now, why is all of this happening and what do you do? Um, I have a lot of suggestions on this. One, if you're an author, you probably do not get much exercise. Shame on you. <laughs> exercise bumps serotonin. Serotonin can not only make you feel happier, make you feel calmer, make you feel more relaxed. It's not dopamine high. It's just the contented, things are nice right now. So, you exercise, you get more serotonin. What it also does is it increases learning, it increases creativity, it increases speed and efficiency of neurons firing, it increases your capacity to do whatever you're going to do. 
it also makes you feel more confident. So, get your exercise, please. If you're stuck, go for a run, do push-ups, something along those lines. My most successful story plotting sessions have happened on a treadmill while listening to Sticks at Top Volume. <laughs> now, this is extremely important. Exercise has shown, now I'm not making a statement about meds, I'm making a statement about serotonin. But exercise has shown to improve mood as much as antidepressants do. As much as, which beats the placebo. Now, that's not saying that you don't need both. That's not saying that you, there's one that you should. Yeah, you should consider all options. But if you're not exercising, try that. You know, not all neurotropic medications are awful, but there are side effects. And hey, if you can have the exercise without the side effect, that's great. If that fixes it on its own, great. If not, it'll almost certainly help. Now, being you, it's going to be very difficult to get that done. So, what I would recommend in that case, uh, probably something a little bit more goal-oriented. There are tons of apps beyond just Pokemon Go that encourage you to go for a million-mile walk or go for a million-mile run. My wife and I, until she broke her foot, um, went biking like almost every evening to play Pokemon Go. We had had a gym membership for quite a while and had been maybe a dozen times, but it was Pokemon Go that got us there. We had a thing that we were actively pursuing. Um, I would also recommend fitocracy.com. You input your uh, your workout and you level up and you associate with a lot of other people and find people to work out with in your area. And it's a lot easier when you're focusing it towards a goal or when you're doing it with people. Um, food and nutrition. If you're an author, you probably eat whatever's there. This can be a really big problem because sometimes when someone is depressed, it's as simple as here, take vitamin D. Or just take some time out in the sunlight and absorb your own vitamin D, which, by the way, is a whole lot more healthy because of the phytochemicals allow you to absorb it. It's always more helpful to get it from the natural source than from the supplement. Supplements help if you can't get it anywhere else, but that's aside. I told you, I study everything. I'm a nutritionist, too. All right. No, I'm not a nutritionist. I study nutrition briefly. Um, uh, be around people. Yes, you're an introvert. Yes, it's going to be terrifying, but it's okay. Just be around people that you trust, people that you care about. It'll activate different parts of your mind. If you're getting depressed, you're not going to be as likely to be driven to work on your story. And if you're not away around people, you're going to be getting depressed. So if you decide, I'm not going to go hang out because I need to work on my story every time, then you're further isolating yourself, further depressing, and further preventing your work. Be sure to take time for self-care, for your mental hygiene. Now this isn't even if you're depressed or anxious or whatever. Just being around people can spark different parts of your brain. There is no visual stimulus that lights up as much of the human brain as another human face. So you're activating more parts of your brain every time you look at another human being. Um, sometimes you just run into a mental fatigue and you stop, take a break. Get up, walk around, get your blood flowing. Maybe get a standing desk and switch to the standing desk at that point. Something along those lines. Just let your subconscious mind work on whatever problem you're having. Um, okay. Now, there's a, uh, I don't have it open class. Okay. Now, more specific techniques. I find, I, I used to be a complete discovery writer, pants or whatever you want to call it. I'd just start and just write all the way through. And I discovered that I wanted to write a lot more complex plots. And sometimes they would magically come together when I did that because of the hyper-associational brain. Even if you're a pantser, you're still a plotter. It's just you don't consciously plot it, it's just coming. And sometimes it doesn't always make sense and you write yourself into a corner and, well, I'm sorry, your subcortices are just not as smart as all of you. Um, but, um, I began to expand my, uh, my writing skills by trying to force myself to plot. It used to be if I knew how it was going to end, it was boring and I didn't want to finish it. Well, that's one way to be driven to write. As I began to force myself to comply with this very foreign, organized form of creativity, I began to discover a whole different facet of my own personal enjoyment of writing. I began to say, ooh, now I need to figure out how to do this and get this information across and make it not be deathly boring. And it was really difficult and challenging and fascinating. And even though like, right now I am not feeling the muse and inspired to write, I have to figure out how to make this worth something. Now, as I began to do that, I also began to figure out different ways that I could tangibly inspire my muse. Um, the type of, uh, of therapy that I primarily do is 
very difficult to express in a short amount of time. Um, and so I'm not even going to try. I'm just going to say it's third wave cognitive behavioralism, which allows for individual <coughs> choice. It's not deterministic. It is not you are a product of your chemicals and your environment. It is those are very significantly important factors. But you can only take control of what you notice consciously. And it is expanding awareness into your unconscious, connecting with these unconscious parts and helping them resolve. Like they've heard that one manager at the top speaking through the microphone, they've heard a word or two because they always try to pay attention to him whenever they can hear him or her. Um, but they just catch snippets and phrases. But if you can form a connection and say, no, 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 as the master of the hive mind, you're doing a good job, but you just got this part wrong. Usually, once it notes that connection, it will fix itself. I suggest the book, uh, The Brain That, uh, that Changes Itself by Norman Deutsch. Um, for a little bit more practical depression and anxiety, I highly recommend uh, Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life by Stephen C. Hayes. Both of them talk about mindful awareness and mindfulness meditation. Spend some time doing nothing. Let everything froth to the surface. Sometimes when you're blocked creatively, it's because there's a subcortex that has noticed an error or thinks it has noticed an error and is screaming for your attention. And it might be that there's something very important that you need to know, or it might be that it just got its wires crossed or just wanted to be heard. Could now, you name those titles one more time? I'm yes. Sorry. Um, uh, Get Out of Your Mind and Into Your Life by Stephen C. Hayes. That's Stephen with a P-H, H-A-Y-E-S. Get out of your mind and what? Get out of your mind and into your life. And then the brain that changes, was that the other The brain that changes itself. Thank you. And that's by Norman D. Deutsch, I think, D-O-I-D-G-E. Um, and they're, they're both brilliant. None of them speak directly to this topic, but if you're as associati associative as you probably are, you'll see how it connects, and it's really brilliant and genius. And what this means is, like a lot of time people ask me, uh, is, is this a cognitive problem? Is this a chemical problem? Despite the fact that, like, there is something going on there that we cannot even detect, like with the coma patients. Quite frankly, as far as we can honestly state any evidence, there is no difference between the cognitive and the chemical. Dopamine makes you feel happy. Cortisol makes you feel stressed and aware. When you have a thought, you are changing your brain structure, neurons that fire together, wire together. Therefore, Everything that you do changes the person that you were from who you were a second ago. Now what this means is, you can intentionally wire your brain with specific, <laughs> focused thought. These books do a lot of a good job of training that. There's one other that I would rec uh, recommend. Uh, the Mind and the Body, Neuroplasticity and the Power of Mental Force. Now that's a huge uh, mouthful. I'm just going to write it up here on the board, come up and see it afterwards. Um, but it's, it's very deep but it was the first effective treatment for OCD, and it's purely in the mind. It's purely creating specific meditative states to be able to connect and hear. Now, finish it up. The, uh, the basic approaches that I would recommend for, uh, for, for getting out of the writer's block. For me, a lot of the times, I didn't know what was going to happen next. I thought I did. I was certain I did. But then I would review it, and I'd go, oh, I have a blank spot here. Subconsciously, part of me noticed that and said, I don't know what to do next and therefore I'm paralyzed by choice, therefore I'm not going to write. Now, one successful way that I've tried this, I heard the, the recommendation, I'm sorry, I don't remember who the quote, but he said, figure out where the light is coming from in the next scene. That's it. He's like, whenever I start a scene, I figure out where the light is coming from. Now, from that, I began to expand, and I began to see all these other aspects which I didn't know. It's like, I don't know where the light is coming from. I guess the light is supposed to be off there. But that gave me a place to start. Now, so... It might be that you need to think about where you're going. It might be that part of you has a problem with something you just wrote and wants you to go back and fix that. And you're infinitely stuck in revision errors. But even just addressing it, thinking, letting everything bubble and froth, just stopping and going, okay, okay, okay. Meeting here, everybody in, okay. I'm gonna calm down. I'm not gonna just block you all out like I usually do with all of the things that I always am doing all of the time. I'm either on Facebook or I'm eating or I'm driving and listening to the radio. Or I'm doing... We do this to ourselves and then we get further and further disconnected from these various subcortices. And so just kind of get everybody on the same page. You know, we don't have time to ride the horse 45 miles to town and back, you know, once a month. And so we don't have this quiet time. It's been proven that 15 minutes a day of calm, letting it simmer, can be more effective than a whole lot of other psychotropic medications, talk therapy, a whole lot of other things. And is almost <laughs> universally going to help. 
Now, again, not the full result, and different people have different results, but just give it a try. Five, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, whatever you can give, just, just sit there. You don't have to know anything about meditation. Don't try to think things, don't try to not think things. Just let whatever's happening in your brain happen as long as you're noticing what it feels like, noticing where it's going. The important thing is not the question. Uh, it's not the answer, it's the question. It's telling these, these subcortices, okay, we need to think about this. There's something important. And that really, really helps. Now, um, being able to put yourself into your character. Uh, Edgar Allan Poe, I think it was, would facially mask the, uh, the expression that his character was making, and that would help them feel. That's called biofeedback. If you smile, you feel happier. Even if they had people hold a chopstick in their teeth, and it feels like a smile. Um, and that made them happier. They were 30% happier than the people who didn't have a chopstick in their mouth all day. <laughs> they were chapped, they were sore, they, but they were happy! <laughs> so, when you're depressed, you will slouch, you will move slow. When you are less on hope. So if you notice that, fuck it up! Now this won't fix it, but it can help. When you're starting to feel whatever it is, don't worry about what it is that you're feeling, think about what you like to be feeling, and imitate that. So the way that I translated that into writing is, I don't care if I'm writing what's actually going to be happening, I just need to keep writing. And this is a tactic that a lot of people take. And sometimes I would end up just typing out arguments, me, to my characters. And they're like, dude, you need to be writing right now. And I'm like, I know, shut up. And they're like, why aren't you writing? And I'm like, I don't know. And just processing it this way really helped me to kind of work it out. This is why I'm writing. And, and this is why I'm having trouble with this aspect, or this character isn't jiving, or, and, and figure out where I need to go. Now, if you're just having trouble coming up with something creative, put more stuff in your brain. Go listen to the news. Check out a science article if you're a science fiction guy, or if you want some ideas for some really crazy, zany stuff to do, uh, <clears throat> In, in, uh, in fantasy. Um, so, we have take care of yourself, mentally, physically, go on walks, eat right. We have uh, thinking through all of these things. Now, um, the final thing that I'd like to say, um, and then I'll open up for maybe two questions, I'm sorry I'm out of time, um, is a as you think and reinforce different things within yourself, <laughs> It takes a while, and it'll be frustrating at first, but you'll begin to see changes. One of the biggest problems in my mind is we too often ask questions to the universe. Who am I? We ask questions, uh, what am I supposed to be doing? But as Frankel said, the important thing is not to find the answer from the universe, but for a man to realize that it is he that is asked. Who are you? What are you supposed to be doing? The biggest, strongest aspect that I can push on mental health is the empowerment of you. Now, you can't have endless limits to just change every mental thing that you want to change. <laughs> but there are a lot of progress in this neuroplastic effort of taking control, of not just saying, and th this is not simple to do, it's most difficult to do with the most creative people, with the people who need it the most, it is most difficult to do. Be patient with yourself. You are practicing Rome. It's not built in a day. But the more that you think to yourself, I am asking myself who I am. It's not, am I a horrible person? It's, I am not a horrible person. Therefore, I will not think this. As you do that, keep in mind that people who read your books have neurons that are firing. People who read your books are being wired by what you write. What we understand about a marriage and, and, and about, about romance is taught to us by a lot of writers and producers and authors. Are you writing something that is helping to build a healthier society? Are you teaching them that lust at first sight is love? <laughs> that the relationship is done when a conflict arises? Are you creating a conflict for conflict's sake? Or is there something real going on there? There is a deep responsibility that you have because you are playing in the brains of other human beings. I don't want you to feel responsible for everything, but do be careful what you put in your books to make sure that you are giving someone good mental nutrition and that they are a better person for having read what you read. Do not promote hate and violence. The villain these days must be destroyed, never redeemed. The villain is unchangeable. Not always, 
but so frequently he can only end in death because we can never trust him to be good. What are we teaching ourselves?